Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Good morning, good morning. And it's so awesome to be here with you guys today at Elevate Church. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you guys are blessed. You're looking sharp as always, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's always a blessing uh, to be here, to come back home. You know, this is coming back home for me. You know, I love what God's doing in Tennessee, but it's always such a blessing to come here and, and, and see what God's doing here back home and, you know, and, and, and to sit underneath the, uh, the, the tutelage of, of, of Pastors Mauricio in Virginia. I think we have the, the best pastors, uh, you know, that, that God could ever have given us, and I, I thank God for them. But yes, let's celebrate them. It's amazing. You know, it's amazing uh, what, what they're doing here. And uh, the biggest question that I've gotten the most uh, since I've been here is, hey, what's going on in Clarksville, Tennessee? Uh, well, uh, we launched our church. Uh, we launched Elevate Clarksville uh, right in the heartland, right outside of Nashville in, in the city of Clarksville on April 1st, uh, 2018. So April 1st last year, uh, we had our official launch. Uh, yes, we launched the church on April Fool's Day. So... Uh, I know people are like, is, is it real or is it not? Should I go or should I stay? In fact, I was just going to not show up at all. Just to be like, April Fool, I got you guys. No, I'm kidding. But, um, but uh, uh, to, to give you guys a report of what's going on, uh, it's amazing that in a year and a half since we've, been, since we've launched, we've actually outgrown our first facility. And, uh, and not only have we outgrown our first facility, you know, we went to two services. And, you know, as we were gearing up, figuring out what we're going to do for the fall, we've actually, uh, we're, we're, we're blessed with an amazing opportunity to go to a larger facility that was twice the square footage, uh, at which we actually have our first uh, service there uh, starting September 8th. So uh, it's a really exciting time uh, for that. But here's what I want you to know. Is we couldn't do that without you, without your prayers, without your support. So I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for covering us in prayer and, 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 and lifting us up. Uh, we, you know, because there's such an amazing thing that's happening in Tennessee right now. You know, not just at Elevate Church, but, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but, you know, the, the number one fastest growing church in America is actually in Clarksville, Tennessee. You know, uh, and, and, and it's an amazing thing to see the revival that's happening in this town. I mean, you know, churches everywhere, the pastors and, and, and all of us, you know, it's, it's like we've, we actually become really good friends. Like we actually hang out together, you know, we support each other. And it's just an amazing thing to see the revival that God has done in Tennessee. And I'm so blessed that he was able to position Elevate Church to have an opportunity to go there and help with the harvest that God is sending to that area, you know, because positioning is important. How many of you guys know positioning is important? Yeah. Yeah, say, in fact, say that. Say positioning is, important. positioning is important. I'll tell you a little story. It takes place in 1976. Uh, there was a gentleman. Actually, there was three gentlemen in 1976 that wanted to start a business. Uh, two of the gentlemen, uh, they owned 45% of the company. And there were two younger guys. And, and there was this one older guy. He owned about 10% of the company. In fact, the two younger guys, uh, they started arguing and they were bickering. They didn't get along very much. And the older guy that owned 10%, he was kind of like, like the big brother that kept them together. And he's the one that, that sort of kept them from arguing and, and tried to get things together. And, and he wrote up all the business contracts. And they went out and they got a loan for $15,000 in 1976 to start their company. And so the older guy, he started thinking about it. He says, well, wait a second. These guys... They don't have a house. They don't have any assets. If, if, if this thing goes belly up, the bank's going to come after me. They're not going to come after these two guys. And so he started to panic. And, 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 and 12 days after they launched their company, he sold his 10% back to Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs for $800. For $800, he sold 10% of Apple Computer. Today... The market value of Apple computer is roughly about $67 billion. Billion with a B. How many of you guys know that guy is like just <laughs> kicking himself every day? I can't believe that. You know? And it's funny because he does interviews and things like that. And he like, you know, oh, yeah, it's fine. I totally am okay with it. No, you're not. <laughs> but positioning matters, right? And see, so here's the thing is, and what I want to do is I want to make sure that I don't miss what God has for me in the season that I'm in because I'm out of position. And so uh, if you read uh, in, in the book of 1 Samuel, I want to talk about uh, the army of Israel. It says Saul and his son Jonathan and the men, I'm sorry, if, if you're following along, it's, it's 1 Samuel 13, 
starting at verse 16. It says, Saul and his son Jonathan and the men with them were staying in Gibeah and Benjamin. And while the Philistines camped at Michmash, raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments. One tor- turned toward Ophrah, not Oprah, but Ophrah, uh, in the vicinity of Shaul. Another toward Ben Haran. And the third toward the border, borderland uh, overlooked in the valley, the valley of Zeboim, facing the wilderness. Now I want you to pay attention to where the enemy surrounded them. The enemy surrounded them to the north, to the east, and to the west. Notice the enemy didn't surround them to the south. You see, because the enemy doesn't mind you going backwards. He just doesn't want you to advance. The enemy just doesn't want you to go forward. And so here, and so here the enemy is, 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 is he wants to make it harder, to, harder for you to go forward, but easier for you to go back, to go back to the old relationships, to go back to the old you, to go back to the old things that God has delivered you from, that God has brought you back out of. And this is what the enemy does, is he tries to make it harder for you to advance. And then you keep reading and it says, and not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all of Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, mattoxes, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattoxes and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. And so now here, Israel is disarmed. They're surrounded on all sides, but they also don't have any weapons to fight with. All they have is farming tools. And, and, and it's a really genius strategy when you think about it. Because the Philistines, they were seafaring people. They had this ability to work with metal. They, 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 they were really good. In fact, they could, they could shape and form and forge tools faster better and, and, and less expensive than the Israelites could. And so the Israelites kept going to the Philistines to get their tools made, to get their tools sharpened, to, to, to be able to get, get their metal work done. And so eventually there were no more Israelites. I mean, there were no more blacksmiths in all of Israel. And so what they did was, was, was they took the, 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 the blacksmiths out of rotation because the blacksmiths kept going to them. I mean, because the, the people kept going to them, to the Philistines. And because they had no, no blacksmiths, they relied on the enemy to be able to sharpen their tools. Because the enemy doesn't mind you knowing how to farm. He just doesn't want you to know how to fight. And so, and here's the interesting thing is they didn't lack iron. They didn't lack resources. What they lacked was an understanding of what to do with the resources that they already had. And a lot of times we don't lack resources, we lack resourcefulness. And so, and, and here's the thing is what I want you to understand. If God gave you a gift, you have a gift. The enemy can't take that away from you. The enemy can't take away from you what God's put on the inside of you. But what the enemy tries to do is he tries to get you to think that you have to go to him in order to sharpen the very gifts and tools that God's given you. And oftentimes we end up turning to the world in order to, in order to shape and mold us. And really everything that we need is right there in the presence of God. And so, and, and, and it's, 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 so here it is on the day of the battle, right? No one had any weapons to fight with. Everyone's standing there with farming tools. And so the very thing that they had to fight with, the very weapons that they had to fight with are now being shaped and formed in the very, by the very enemy that they were called to defeat. And the enemy's been doing this since the beginning of time. In the book of Genesis, God created man. And when God created man, you know, you know the story, Adam and Eve are in the garden. And as Adam and Eve are in the garden, the enemy comes in and he says to them, he says, you can eat this fruit. You won't die. As a matter of fact, God knows that if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. And so that's what the enemy does. He tries to trick you. See, here's the thing is, they were already like God. The Bible says that when he made man, he formed man in his own image. So they were already like God. So the enemy's trying to sell you on an identity that God's already given you in the first place. And so he's been doing this, you know, since the beginning of time. And so here here he is. They they eat of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, the one thing that they couldn't eat from. They could eat of any tree, but this one tree that they ate of, and now all of a sudden they become more self aware and less God aware. And then they start hiding from God, right? So what's the will of God? 
The will of God there in the garden was for man and for God to walk and dwell with men, to fellowship with man. And so here now, that, that was his will for man. And so now here he is. They're in the garden, and they're hiding from God. And God comes down, and he says, Adam, where are you? Now, I want you to think about this. God knew exactly where Adam was. Like, it was no secret. Like, you know, Adam, I know exactly where you are. You're, you're hiding behind tree number 346,802. I know. I created the tree, Adam. He knew where Adam was, so his question isn't a question of positioning, but it's a question of, well, pardon me, it's not a question of proximity, but it's a question of positioning. He knew the proximity of where he was, but he's asking, Adam, where are you? What's your positioning? Because, see, the thing is, the will of God was for him to fellowship with, with, with man. And so here he is. Now he's positioned himself to be outside of the will of God. And that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to trick us to position ourselves so that we're no longer walking in God's will. Because the enemy knows that if he can get you to position yourself outside of the will of God, that's where he can attack and that's where he can fight and that's where he can try to bully you the most. You don't have to try to pick a fight with the enemy. You know, I remember when I was in, uh, I was in about seventh grade, I was, I was in middle school. And I was a little skinny kid. I was a little scrawny thing. In fact, I was probably about 95 pounds soaking wet. I looked like I was real skinny, had these real big ears. I looked like a parking meter. And, um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I was a real timid kid. And, and, and there was this bully who had just, like, picked on me the entire year in seventh grade. You know, this, this, he just, I mean, you know, uh, it just, I mean, he just all year long, I mean, all, the entire school year. And, 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 and um and one day, it was like toward the end of the school year, and he looks at me and he says, you know, we're standing around. He looks at me and he points to me and he's like, he, he wants to fight. He's like, you, me, outside, 315. Because that's how you did it back then in the 80s. It was like 315 outside, right? And so, you know, I'm scared. I'm sitting there and I'm watching and, and I'm looking at the clock. And, and how many, and, you know, like, and like the day is just going by real slow because I don't want to go outside at 315 because I know it's about to come to me, you know. And so I'm sitting there, and, and then how many of you guys know 315 actually eventually came? And so, <laughs> you know, I was hoping I can wait it out, but it showed up. And so, um, so 315 came, and uh, I'm like the last one to leave the classroom. I'm like strolling out. I go to my locker. I'm hanging out. And then, and then I'm thinking to myself, okay, surely he's gone by now. Right? And so I'm waiting, and, and, you know, I don't know, it's probably like five minutes. You know, five minutes is like an eternity to a 12-year-old. And so <laughs> I walk outside, right, and the doors open to the school, and all the students are standing outside yelling, fight, 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 fight. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Why are you guys still here? But, you know, I, I couldn't, I had to act tough, right? I mean, I wasn't going to go out there and be like, I'm sorry, I don't want to fight. I had to act tough, so I just looked around, well, what you going to do? He looked at me, what you going to do? I'm like, because that's what you did in the 80s, right? No one, like, threw a punch. He said, what you going to do? What you going to do? What you going to do? You know? And so we sat there. We did that for about five minutes. And then all of a sudden, uh, my sister, right, my sister, who today, today my sister, to this day, is four foot, ten and a half inches tall. Today, right? So back then, I mean, she was, like, 13. So she was, like, this tall. And so my sister out of the blue, just comes up, and she just starts wailing on this poor kid. She hits the kid in the face, and she knocks him down, and she's just on top of him, and she's beating the kid. He's got a bloody nose. And by this time, the poor kid's like, stop. I'm sorry. Please stop. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, Lee, what are you doing? Please get off, the, get off this kid. What are you, just leave him alone. He said he's sorry. Stop hitting him. <laughs> you know. But my sister, she didn't care. And then, you know, and, and then she looks at me, and she, she, she points at me. She says, now you get over here and hit him. Uh-uh. <laughs> She's like, you get over here and hit him right now. Or I'm going to come hit you. <laughs> so I walk over, and I'm like, mm, take that. And then I was like, run away. <laughs> and the kid gets up. I feel so sorry for this kid. Uh, you know, but, and it's, it's so funny because I look at my sister. Now, this is my big sister. You know, I, I won't tell you how old she is, but uh, uh, I'm 43, and she's a year older than me. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so my sister. Right. So, you know, I look at this, and, and, and here she is, you know, she, she, she wanted me to come face someone that was in opposition to me, but I was afraid to. But here's the thing. I didn't have to fight for victory. I had to fight from victory. Victory had already been won. 
I had to fight. And that's what I want you to realize as, as, as people, as men and women of God, you don't have to fight for victory. You're fighting from victory. You already have been given the victory. And the enemy, the enemy is defenseless against what, what, what God has already placed in you. Ephesians 6 says, you know, it says, put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the attacks of the enemy. We don't have to put on the whole armor of God so that we can go fight. It says, put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand. All we have to do is stand the ground that God's given us. We don't have to go on the attack. But oftentimes, we go into battle with no armor on. You know, I remember one time I was, I was feeling pretty defeated. You know, I mean, things are hard. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, I was going through a rough time and a rough patch, and I felt like I just have been getting attacked from all sides, you know. And there were certain areas in my life I said, you know, I just want to quit certain things. I'm just, I'm just done. I'm tired, <laughs> you know. And I felt like, and, and I, I confided in my wife, and, and I started talking to her, and I said, you know, I just feel like the enemy is just, I feel like he's winning. I feel like he's just attacking. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You guys you ever know, the, you know those people that you can just confide in and you can just talk to? And they always know just the right thing to say to make you feel better. Yeah, that's not my wife. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. She, <laughs> she looked at me. She was like, she was like, so you feel like the fiery darts of the enemy are just coming in? I said, yes, that's how I feel. She said, well, well your faith is low. What does the word say? And I'm like, yeah, gee, thanks, right? You know, that's what I need, another sermon. <laughs> but she was absolutely right. Because, see, the Bible, and she looked at me, she says, because the word of God says that the shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. And she said, so when you're feeling like this, you need to turn toward the word, word, word and stop listening to the words that are going through your own head, through your own perspective, through your own mind. Because what you're doing is you're looking at the battle from your perspective, but you're not looking at the battle from what God has already said. Because the enemy wants to create chaos in your life. Chaos. You know, my son, uh, just this year, this summer, and he was in summer camp. My, my kids were, and my son and daughter, one morning, and I, I'm getting ready to take them swimming. And I, I come out of my room, and I say, hey, kids, go upstairs, put your bathing suits on. We're getting ready to go swimming, right? And so now I know we call them swimming trunks here in California. In the south, we call them bathing suits. So I said, go put your bathing suits on. We're getting ready to go swimming. My little girl, she gets up. She runs upstairs. She puts on her, her swimsuit, the little, you know, like dress-looking thing that goes over it. I never understood that. And she's got that. She's got her towel and her flip-flops on, and she's like ready to go swimming. I come out the room. I look at my son. He's still sitting on the couch with his tablet playing his video game on his tablet. He's five. He's playing a video game on his tablet, and he's still sitting there. Now, I get a little upset. Son, go upstairs. Put your bathing suit on. We're going to go swimming. Don't make me have to tell you again. <laughs> you know, you got to get that face. Don't make me have to tell you again. Right? And, you know, how many of you guys know I had to tell him again? So, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, he, he puts, you know, so he runs upstairs and, you know, I just hear chaos going on in his room. I hear like he's, he's opening up the drawers. I hear drawers slamming. And I'm like, what is going on? And so he comes downstairs completely undressed. And by this time, I'm like, okay, Lord, just. Just take me now, Lord. Just take. I said, son, we're going swimming. Go upstairs. Get dressed for swimming. Go put your bathing suit on right now. I swear if I got to tell you one more time. Yeah. Look, don't judge me. I know. I see you guys judging me right now with your judging eyes. Don't act like you ain't never yelled at your kids. And so, uh, and so, um, and so my son runs upstairs. And this time he comes downstairs completely naked with shoes on. Oh, my gosh. I'm done. <laughs> so we, let's go. Right now, we're grabbing, we're marching up the stairs. And, you know, he's five. All the time, he's still got his tablet in his hand, right? <laughs> it's like, and, and, and then I said, son, I told you to put on your bathing suit. Why didn't you do what I told you to do? Why are you being disobedient? And he looks at me, and he just starts to cry. And then all of a sudden, I start to feel compassionate. And I look, and I realize something. I said, what's wrong, son? He says, I don't know what bathing shoes are. And I was like... <laughs> Um, but then I noticed something I hadn't noticed before. He was wearing my ear pods, my Apple ear pods. Not that I'm endorsing anything Android users, <laughs> but all Apple users go to heaven, I heard somewhere. <laughs> but, so he's wearing, so he's wearing, he's wearing my Apple ear pods, and he was listening to music, and he couldn't understand what I was saying clearly. 
he would have obeyed me had he knew what I was, had he understood the instructions that I was trying to give him. He wanted to be obedient, but he couldn't hear clearly what I was trying to tell him. And that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to, he wants to surround us things that distort us hearing from the voice of God so that we can't understand what God is telling us to be obedient. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So if the enemy wants to create hey, chaos in your life, it starts, by what you, it starts with what you hear. And what we've been telling ourselves, that's why Philippians 4 says this. Philippians 4, chapter 8, of Philippians 8, verse 4 says this. It says, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That cancels out all social media right there. <laughs> I can't keep a steady diet on news and current events and social, social things and things that don't matter. I can't keep a steady diet on that and expect, and expect to be able to walk in the fullness of God and hear God clearly because I'm so worried about, uh, about things that don't matter. Because the enemy wants to surround you around things that's going to distract you. You look at the army of Israel, going back to the army of Israel, 1 Samuel. So here they are, they're surrounded. And chapter 14, verse 1 says this, it says, And one day, I'm sorry, and, and one day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migran. With him were about 600 men, among, who, among whom was, a, was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. An ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's high priest, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. And no one was aware that Jonathan had left. Now I want you to keep this in mind. The reason that Israel went to Samuel in the first place and said that they wanted a king was so that they would have a king that would lead them in battle like the other nations. That's what they told Samuel. And they chose Saul to be their king. And so here Saul is, the one that they chose, the people chose to lead them in battle. And the Bible says he's sitting underneath the pomegranate tree. And notice he's sitting with all the important people. He's sitting with all of the religious people. In fact, he's sitting, he's sitting with Ichabod's nephew. Ichabod means the glory has departed. Fourth generation of the glory has departed. And he's sitting with him underneath the pomegranate tree, and he says he's wearing an ephod. An ephod is a, is, is, is a, it's, it's, it's a device that's worn on a breastplate, and it has two stones. It's called uh, Urim and Thummim. And, and they would spin them around, and wherever they would land, they, they'd use it to, to try to help discern the will of God. This is what the Israelites did. It was kind of like a magic eight ball in the day. If you guys know what that is, remember the little magic eight ball? You shake it up. Magic eight ball. Should, should I call him or should I not? And you shake it up and see. <laughs> I don't think so. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, and so, so here they are, you know, and so here he is, he's sitting underneath the pomegranate tree, sitting in a passive position with the religious people, waiting to hear from the Lord. And I think oftentimes us as Christians, we take waiting to hear from the Lord and use it as an excuse for our inactivity and our spiritual laziness. Come on, that's good. And so here they are, they're sitting and they're waiting in a passive position, full of passivity. And the Bible says that they're sitting underneath the pomegranate tree. Do you know what a pomegranate tree is? It's a tree that grows pomegranates. I learned that in seminary. A pomegranate tree. A pomegranate is a fruit that's full of seeds. Seeds represent potential. What can be. They're sitting passively. With all of this potential wasting away in a passive position. The potential to do great things. The potential for greatness. But instead they decided to sit. But Jonathan, he wanted, him and his armor bearer wanted to take matters into their own hands. And they said, hey, let's go up. Let's go find these Philistines and let's go fight. Let's go fight this battle. And notice he didn't even go tell the important people. He didn't even go tell the religious people. He just decided to, to take his, who did he tell? Who did he take with him? He took his servant. The one that was in the position to serve was the one that had an opportunity to go and fight the battle with him. 
Sometimes the greatest thing that we can do is position. Remember we said positioning matters. Sometimes the greatest thing we can do is position ourselves in, in a place where we can go and serve God. And we position our place in, in a way to serve other people. When we position ourselves in a way to serve, that's when oftentimes we go and fight the greatest battles. Amen. Listen, when, 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 when David went to go slay Goliath, that wasn't his mission. When, when, when David went and he slayed Goliath, do you know how he ended up getting to the battlefield in the first place? His father said, hey, here's some bread and some cheese. Go take these grilled cheese sandwiches to your brothers on the front line of the battlefield. He was there serving. And because he was serving, God positioned him to go and fight the greatest battle in Israel because he had the heart of a servant. And so... And so, uh, so Jonathan went on, and he, he talked to his armor bearer, and he said, let's go. God's going to give us the victory. And watch this. It says on each side, on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozaz and the other Sina. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash and the other toward the south of Gibeah. One was called Sina, which means thorny, and the other was called Bozaz, which means slippery. So on one side, you have a thorny climb which represents the pain of progress. God, I want to love like you said love, but it hurts. I want to forgive like you, like you said forgive, but it hurts to let go. But yet we want to continue to climb anyway. And it's the, the harder we climb, the higher we climb, the more it hurts. And on the other side is a slippery climb, a slippery slope. And some people may be fighting some things in our lives and say, God, you know what, I'm climbing I'm trying to get ahead. I'm trying to go where you called me to go. But it seems like the further I go, the more I slide back down. And, yeah, I may, I, may have, I may have tried to get my attitude under control. I may have tried to break addiction. I may have tried to break bondage. And it seems like no matter how high I go, I just keep sliding back down, and I keep going back toward the addiction or the bondage or the thing that, that, that I've been trying to run from all this time. And so on one side, we've got a heart. So, so the, the climb is hard. The climb to get to the battle was a hard climb. But it's a necessary climb. And the scariest part about it is the further you climb, the further you have to fall. But the climb was just as important as the battle. You know, when I was a young soldier in Afghanistan, we got intel that, that there was a, a, a terrorist uh, training camp in, 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 in an area of operation. And, and our platoon was, uh, we were assigned to go and disrupt the operation. And I remember sitting through the operation order, and, and, and I noticed something that seemed quite odd to me. I'm sitting through the operation order, and they're telling us about the operation and how the operation is going to go. And I realized that we're going to start at the base of the mountain and climb up to the top of the mountain to go disrupt this, you know, this terrorist training camp. It was a two-day climb. We're carrying about 90 pounds worth of equipment. Now, this is why it's strange to me. We're both airborne and air assault qualified. What that means is we can either jump out of airplanes or rope out of a helicopter. Surprise, enemy, we're here. You know, I mean, think that it's logical, right? Why would we climb to the top of the mountain when we could just take a helicopter? Duh. And so here I am complaining about having to do this climb. And then my commander, he comes over here. He says, hey, Sims, I want to tell you something. He says, yeah, we could take a helicopter to the top of the mountain. But here's the problem. When you get up there, you won't be able to fight because you haven't taken the steps necessary to be able to get your lungs acclimated to the altitude that you need to be in order to fight in that atmosphere. The climb was just as important as the fight because a lot of times we want to get from here to here. We want to get to the top without taking necessary steps to get to the top. We just want to go to the top. And if I want to go from here to here, see, because what we do as Americans is we celebrate big achievements, but we don't celebrate small steps. And oftentimes we want to get to the top and we want to take big, large steps to get there. And I'm not going to do it. I'm not about to split my pants on a Sunday morning in the presence of God and all these assembled witnesses. I'm not going to do it. But steps are necessary. But the problem is we get stuck along the way. And the biggest thing that usually gets us stuck is our past. The biggest thing that stops you from moving forward is your past. I've tried that before and it didn't work. I've done that before and it hurt. 
or I'm, I don't think I'm good enough because of what I've done. And our past oftentimes, and, and so what happens is we try to take a step, and we take a step. Let me ask you a question. Is that a step? Yeah. Somebody like, yes, no. Like, I don't know. What does he want me to say? <laughs> so I say it's a step, but it's not a completed step. Because a step is designed to get us from one place to another. And oftentimes we, we start a step, and we're standing here between brokenness and blessing, brokenness and blessing, and we're teetering between the two. And God is saying, if you just continue to move forward and move to the place that I told you to go, that everything that you've been through back here would be worth it. But we get stuck along the way. And so we have to realize that God celebrates small steps. So in order to get to where God called me to go, it's not a matter of me taking a giant leap, but one small step and another, going from step to step to victory to victory, from hope to hope, from glory to glory. That's how God operates. God operates. See, listen, God operates in small steps. And every single person in here, I don't care how long you've been a believer, or whether you're not a believer at all, every single person in this place has a next step with God. Everybody has a next step. Maybe your next step may be to attend Welcome Home. Maybe your next step might be to, to start attending the life, the, the life track. Maybe your next step with God might be to start tithing. Maybe your next step with God, you know, might be to get plugged in and served on the dream team. Whatever your next step is, I'm encouraging you to be willing to go, to take the next step with God and allow God to lead you. Because the climb is important. You know, and I love the fact that we get to do that together as a church. If I'm going to climb to the top of a mountain, if I'm going to climb Everest, let's say, the first thing I'm going to need is other people. You can't climb alone. We can't climb by ourselves. It's going to take the person right next to you to help you get to the next step, to help you get to the place where God's called you to be. In fact, most of the time, if someone wants to, 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 to climb the Everest, Mount Everest, they, they, they take what they call a Sherpa. A Sherpa is someone that, 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 that that's their guide. They help guide you along the way. They've been, in fact, they, they, they don't, get on t they don't uh, take any pictures. They're not, a, uh, they're not on any covers of any magazines. They're there to be a tour guide. That's it. They're, help, they're there to help you get to the top. And that's all they do. They carry your bags for you because you're not strong enough to carry them on your own. And they help you get to the top. Some of us are called to be spiritual Sherpas. Some of us are called to help other people get to where God called them to be. And so here we are. We, we, we go with these people and we, and we climb. And we're going to the top and we're climbing the mountain. And we're climbing the mountain. And they're there. They're showing us where to step, where to go. And they're there showing us how to get to where God called us to get to. We take selfies along the way. Hey, look at me. And then we climb back down. We go all the way up. And then we come down. Why? Because you weren't meant to live on the mountaintop. You weren't meant to live there. And so we come down. But the minute we come down, we start thinking about other people along the way. Man, you know what? That's an amazing experience. I can't wait to take so-and-so. And bring them up to the mountaintop with me. I can't wait to bring somebody else up here. Because once we've experienced something great with God, we want to bring other people with us. So the purpose of the climb may not necessarily be so that I can get to the mountaintop, but so that I can know the way so I can help bring someone else. And then we come back down and we live life in the valley sometimes. And some of us have been through all kinds of things, and you're still standing. Amen. But God can certainly use you to be a valley tour guide. Listen, I know. I know what it's like to, be, to, have, to, to, to live a life of pain and misery. And you can look at other people and say, hey, listen, there's hope. There is hope. You can, look for, you can look at people and say, God can bring you through this. And you can help people along the way. Listen, what I'm trying to tell you is this, that, that, that everything we do, it's about positioning. It's about what God can do through you. It's not about what God can do for you. Amen. And so looking at position, the position of the climb. Because remember, positioning is important. The climb is important, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the position. 
1 Samuel 14 says this, going back to 14, it says, so Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into, our, into the hands of Israel. And so Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And the Philistines fell before, before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. They had the victory today, but notice it wasn't just the climb. Notice how they made the climb. It said they, they, they had to climb on their hands and their knees. They had to climb on their hands and knees. Our hands, we lift our hands in praise. They represent praise. And sometimes it's a matter of us, when we make a climb, we have to realize, that, listen, I have to use my hands of praise and my knees of prayer. You know, it's a, it's a matter of me lifting my hands and worshiping our God and being on our knees and praying and praying through. Because, listen, the higher you go with God, every, every step up with God, every step up with, with, with the Holy Spirit is a step down to ourself. It's a step down in our flesh. And so, and what I'm trying to say is this, is that and, and, and maybe perhaps it's not about climbing higher, but maybe it's about us going deeper about us going, uh, you know, about us showing humility and going lower. Luke tells a story about a lame man. Luke chapter 5, in verse 17, it says this. It says, one day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. And they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and he tried to take him in, in, into the house to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the towels into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. So here this sick man is. He's lame. He's paralyzed. There's a disconnection in his body. There's a disconnection between his mind and, and, and his legs. His legs won't operate the way that his mind is telling it to. And so he needs to get reconnected. And so how does he reconnect? How does he reconnect? He had four friends. Notice he didn't go to four lame friends. He went to four whole friends. He had four friends that, that he could be transparent with. Listen, I want to tell you, one of the best things that you can do is be plugged in to a life-giving body of believers and have people that you can be transparent with and have people that you can walk with along the way and that have people that can help you walk through the journey. And his four friends, instead of comforting his issue, they realized we need to get him to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but those are the kind of friends that I want in my life. Because I can easily get into a point of complaining and start complaining about all sorts of things. And, you know, there's friends that are, that are sitting and complaining alongside with you. Yeah, girl, I can't believe your husband did that. Yeah, you should go out tonight. You know, <laughs> just. And they try to comfort you. But I don't need a place of comfort. I need my friends to help get me to Jesus. And so here he is, he's laying on this mat. And I often wonder... What sorts of things in our life have we created a mat for? Have we, what sorts of things in our life have we co co created a place of comfort for? What sorts of things in our life have we tried to make, make comfortable that we've created a mat? Maybe, maybe it's our complaining. Maybe it's our grumbling. Whatever it is. Or what, what, maybe it's our attitude. What, what is it in our life that we tried to become comfortable with that we started making excuses for? And so his friends, they grabbed this lame man and, his four friends, they start walking and they decide to take him to Jesus. But the closer they get to Jesus, the harder it is for them to reach him. And they start getting closer. And they can't get, reach Jesus because all the religious people were in the way. All the religious people, the Pharisees, had come from all over, sitting. Here they are again, sitting passively sitting around Jesus. And as these four friends try to approach Jesus, they can't get there because all of the church folks were in the way. God 
Help me to not be in the way of the people that need you. Help me to not be in the way of people that need to be at your feet. Help me not be in the way of people that need your healing and your grace and your mercy. Because oftentimes the biggest things that stop people from getting to Jesus is us. And so because they couldn't get through, they had to find an alternative route. They had to find a different way. So they climbed step by step. They climbed to the rooftop, and when they got to the rooftop, they tore off the roof, and, and Jesus is sitting there, and the ceiling tiles are coming off. And then, and then they start lowering their friend to Jesus. And as they're lowering him, Jesus looks up and says, hey, your sins have been forgiven. Notice what God deals with first. His friends didn't bring him to Jesus so that he can have his sins forgiven. His friend brought him to Jesus because he needed to be healed. But watch what Jesus does first. He deals with his heart. Let God deal with your heart. Listen, if God wants to change you, it starts with your heart. It starts with what God is doing right here. And so, and so they start lowering him to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, the, the religious people start grumbling. Who is this man? How, how dare he says that your sins are forgiven? The only people that can, that can forgive sins is, is, is God. And so watch this. And so as they're lowering him to Jesus, and they're lowering him, and they're getting him down closer and closer to Jesus. The closer they get to Jesus, the further he's getting from his friends. Because there comes a point when we can't carry you anymore. When you have to sit at the feet of Jesus face to face. But why did they make the climb in the first place? It wasn't so that they can go higher. It's so that they can help bring someone else to Jesus. The purpose of the climb, the positioning of the climb, wasn't about how high we go. But it's about where we can take someone else, and that's taking them to be at the feet of Jesus. But if we focus only on the climb, then it becomes all about the climb. And the climb becomes the only important thing to us. And then we, we climb a ladder and we take a step. And all of a sudden that becomes important to us. But we're not satisfied. So we end up taking another step. And we're not satisfied there. So we end up taking another step. And we climb and we climb. And we try to get to the top of the ladder because that's the only thing that's important for us. We'll step over anybody to get there. We get to the top and then, and then oftentimes we think that we should be treated a certain way or we should, we should have a certain amount of prestige. And then from here, I can look down on others. I can look down on you from up here. Look at me. I'm up here. You're down there. Ha, look at you. Right. But it doesn't make a difference how high I climb here if I need to change a light bulb over there. Amen. Positioning is what's important. Positioning is more important than the climb because it doesn't matter how high you climb if you're in the wrong position. Because the saddest part of the story, it says the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. The power of the Lord was with them to heal. He wanted to heal them. He was ready to heal them. He had the power to heal them. But the only person, but we, yet we don't hear about any of them being healed except for the one man that positioned himself at the feet of Jesus, whose friends helped him get to Jesus' feet. So what's the right position at Jesus' feet? It's not about how high I climb, but it's about how deep I go. Father, help me to worship you. Father, let it not be about me and about the climb, but about the people that you've called us to reach, about the next steps that you've called us to take. And so here he is. All the religious people were, were mocking and, and laughing at him and, and scoffing at him for what he said. And he tells the man, he says this, he says, now pick up your mat and walk. And he heals him. And he gets up and he picks up his mat and he walks. 
And so now here he is, this man that has been carrying around this mat, that has been carrying, I mean, here now this man who has been laying on this mat, who's been laying on this bed of, 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 of dysfunction, who's been laying on this bed, and I don't know what bed you've been laying on. Maybe it's been excuses, maybe it's been passivity, whatever it is. Here he is now all of a sudden, the one that's been, 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 been laying on this bed now is carrying it. He's carrying his mat, which means now he's in the position to carry someone else. And listen, whatever it is that you've gone through in your life, oftentimes it's now, it's now, now God is equipping you to carry someone else through it. God is equipping you to carry someone else. And so, Father, I just thank you. Father, I just, forgive me for everything that I've made it. Father, if I've made it about the climb, Lord God, I'm sorry. Father, I thank you that you've put me in the right position, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, that you allow us to be in the position to serve you, the position to do what you've called us to do, Lord God. That we're not focusing on the climb, but we're focusing on the people that you've called us to love like you've loved. And there's some of us here today, I want to say this, maybe some of us in this place today, we've made it all about the climb. And maybe we want to say, God, today I realize that it's, it's more than about me. It's not about me. It's about the people you've called me to. God, I'll take the next step. I'll take the next journey. I'll go on this journey with you. Remember, all of us have a next step. Maybe your next step today is making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Maybe that's the next step. Remember what I said. We celebrate huge things, but, 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 but God celebrates small steps. That's, that, that's, maybe that's the next small step God wants you to take. The Bible says that, that when one person, when one person receives Jesus Christ, that all of the angels in heaven rejoice. They're celebrating your small step. If that's you today, I'm going to ask every eye closed. Every head bowed, no one looking around. If that's you today, and you're here in this place, and you're saying, I want to take this next step, I'm going to ask you two questions. Number one, maybe there's someone in here, you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Maybe salvation is your next step. And there's some of us here in this place today, you said, you know, I've walked with Jesus, but, but it's been a long time since I fellowshiped with him. And I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. I want to make a step and a commitment to serve him today. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, be bold, be obedient. Two, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid. Three, if that's you, I just want you to slip your hand in the air. I want to pray with you. I see those hands. I see those hands going up all across the room. I see those hands all across the room. Let's pray this prayer together. Everyone, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Thank you for being my Lord. Thank you for being my Savior. I believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, for your saving grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a great big round of applause. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the family. Let's welcome them again, church. Welcome to the family. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.